Melissa is a 15-year-old runaway. She has spent the last three years as a ward of the court. Now she's bracing for a tough hearing in front of Judge James Payne. Melissa became a chins, a child in need of services, when her parents' drug addiction left them unable to take care of their kids. And we find out today that Melissa isn't just a teenager. She's also a mom. Her daughter Raven was born seven months earlier with severe brain damage. She has cerebral palsy, and as she gets older and keeps falling off the developmental chart, she's going to have more problems. There's going to be more therapy, whatever. Um, Patty Cavanaugh is the guardian ad litem for Melissa, serving as her representative in court. She's, she's a child herself, and I think she's realizing that now and is in a difficult situation of trying to be a parent and a child. Um, but at the same time, um, she can't be on the run with this baby. And Melissa spent most of her pregnancy on the run with no real place to call home. As her hearing begins in front of Judge Payne, we know Melissa remains a ward of the court. But now we learn Raven is also a child in need of services. Melissa has to listen as the hearing focuses on what should happen to her baby. Raven really needs a caretaker. Melissa's under 18 and she needs a caretaker too. And the foster mother will give everything she can for this baby, but she also needs Melissa's support, including making the most of herself, going back to school, though it's gonna be a very hard thing for her. And if Melissa doesn't make it, um, the, baby, the baby needs to stay with the foster parent. She just really needs to understand that this is crunch time. Melissa, anything you want to say? I understand. I don't care about you. Okay. My job right now on this case is to care about Raven. You've already shown that you don't particularly care in a variety of ways. But you see that young man over there with the glasses standing up? That's Sergeant Terheide. If you take off, I'll ask him to hunt you down and find you and bring you back here. You understand that? And if you happen to decide to leave with Raven, I'll have him and the FBI out looking for you. You will not interfere with the custody of Raven while I have control of her. It's Judge Payne's responsibility in this court hearing to focus solely on the case at hand, the Chins hearing for Raven, who has been in foster care since she was two weeks old. Raven's foster mom is Karen Butterworth. Karen is a married mother with seven children in her home, three biological children, two former foster children she's now adopted, and two medical needs foster babies, including Raven. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? Why is she willing to do that? Um, because she cares. Cares about what? Me and Raven. She primarily cares about Raven. Because Raven needs someone to care for. But I want you to understand what this is about. How old are you? You're 15, and I'm talking to you like you're 25. Raven is going to receive the care that she needs. I'd like that to be you. I'd like you to participate in that. I'd like you to understand what it is, because you are her mother. But if you can or won't do that, we will find someone who will. And then I'll handle you separately. Melissa has lived in a treatment facility that helps troubled kids since giving birth to Raven in June of 2000. Today, she's being released to the custody of her new foster mom. She'll finally be reunited with Raven. Karen says she's willing to take a chance on giving Melissa a home with her baby. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? How many people do you have like that? Just her. Not many, huh? You won't find many people. Don't blow this. Judge Payne admits it's a delicate balancing act when it comes to Melissa and Raven. He knows Melissa's life has not been easy, but the judge is firm with Melissa keeping the primary focus on Raven's well-being. Our responsibility is not to worry about the parent, even though the parent is 15, but to talk about this five-month-old, three-month-old child who, in that case, happens to have all sorts of problems because mother put herself at risk when she was pregnant, didn't get prenatal care, and now the child suffers for the rest of her life. I didn't find out I was pregnant until I was four months, but when I did find out I was pregnant, I hid it. Um, for a while, my dad was out of jail, but went back to prison. They were both on drugs, didn't care what I did. Um, we didn't even have the type of relationship where they even knew that I was pregnant. I hid it from them for till I was seven months pregnant. I didn't tell my, my dad went to jail, but my mom, she wasn't even around me enough to know that I was pregnant. Melissa has been in her new foster home exactly one week. Raven has been with this foster family since she was two weeks old. 
Raven's progress has been remarkable, considering her diagnosis at birth. She was 50% brain damaged. They didn't, they couldn't say for sure what her prognosis was, but it was not, it was not good. We've got a lot of education to do. We have um, lots of therapy to do. Um, and we are right now in a honeymoon phase. The experience will be that Melissa will go home, do okay for a period of time, but she will go back into an environment where she's not real comfortable. And she'll get tired of that. She'll leave, hopefully not with the child, in probably three to five months, if not sooner, and go back out on the streets, and then we'll go on with our situation with, with her child. But Melissa is optimistic. Even though she's not been to school since the sixth grade, she says she looks forward to heading back to the classroom for the first time in three years. She knows how she wants things to be in another month. I like to be in school. Um, hopefully things are going better with Raven. Um, I know when you, if you come back and see me in another month, things will be good. Um, as long as I'm around positive people and make positive decisions, I will be doing just fine. <laughs>35 miles south of Indianapolis in rural Bloomington, Indiana, Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro begins a long day of CHINS hearings, the acronym for Children in Need of Services. The parents are not always at fault. Sometimes they're simply overwhelmed. Linda Wells is a low-income divorced mother of three. She's in front of Judge Talaferro today because she believes her nine-year-old daughter, Chelsea, is severely disturbed and out of control. The child is diagnosed oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and mildly mentally retarded. Chelsea's child welfare case manager, Greg Keyes, and state's attorney, Steve Galvin, tell the court that mom can no Linda longer cope. agrees and in fact uh, has asked for the intervention of the Office of Family and Children in this matter, is that correct? That's correct. She's trying her best, is that correct? Yes, she is. In the past, Linda has asked the court for help in dealing with Chelsea's mental health needs. But this is the first time she's asked the state to take her daughter away. Judge Talaferro recognizes how painful the decision is. You really put forth a, well, I don't have the word to describe the effort that you've put forth to keep your daughter at home. Well, there's not a doubt in my mind that the only reason you're doing this is because you feel you simply cannot handle it at home. These cases present enormous problems for parents because the, the cost of caring for them is just overwhelming and many, many, uh, most people cannot afford to pay for the care of these children and there are not enough facilities for them. So you have parents uh, such as Chelsea's mother who will try every way that can be tried to keep the child at home. But if the child is unmanageable, uh, it cannot be done. I've tried to maintain her for nine and a half years and I can't do it no more. And I'm just hoping that they can keep her here in Bloomington at the Stone Belt where I can see her more often. Linda is urging the court to place her daughter closer to home. But the state's attorney has a different facility in mind called Daymar. It's 35 it's miles away. Into Daymar, if possible. That's a little bit further away, Linda. Were you aware of that? Uh, yeah, and we were just wondering if, um, you know, the state or someone's going to pay for the Daymar. Daymar is an established private facility in Indiana, housing over 160 children with developmental disabilities. And then on a bad day that, um, you know, like if her mind's made up to where she don't want to do nothing, you have to struggle with her, argue, fight her. She's, you know, like if I have to restrain her, she's throwing me around in my living room, you know, picking up boards, hitting me in the head. I've dealt with this for, you know, struggling with it for nine and a half years, you know, trying to keep her from being locked up and taken away from me. Less than a month after her last hearing, Linda returns to court and learns where her daughter will be living. Further that Chelsea should be transferred to Daymar when an opening becomes available. And at Daymar, Chelsea will obtain the special care and treatment provided by Daymar. 
Uh, Damar, of course, is a long-term residential placement and will provide Chelsea with the structure that she needs. Do you agree with them as well? Yes. Do you know very much about Damar yet? Uh-uh. Do you want to go up there before your daughter is transferred yeah, there? Yeah, I'd like to, yeah. Oh, she'll love that because <laughs> she's an outdoor person. Linda makes <laughs> one visit to Damar before her daughter will move in. She arrives with Chelsea's home-based counselor, Megan Dorland, who helps her through the two-hour tour. So for her, it'd be trying to integrate her into a public classroom, a public school, but right. also in a self-contained, right? Because that's where she went. Right. We, yeah. we have a number of different options. Did you have any other questions about, this is a med room in here? It's usually one staff and two children in here cooking. I think every child yeah. does enjoy that, Chelsea the attention. Loves me. That's a nice playground. Living room, family room area, what one of the bedrooms looks like. And we have it pretty divided off, so they have their own privacy. We're going to head to the next building. One staff to four clients over here. That is common. That is very common. Okay. <laughs> but she does like the water, right? Oh, yes, she loves it. <laughs> Each child will have their individual program plan. I'm finding out more about the home and what they provide. And, and I think, it, you know, she does have to come here. I think it this would be a good place for her. That's the goal for all of our kids, to help prepare them to live in, in community settings, whether that be back at home. But no matter how pleased she is with the facility, it's still hard for Linda to come to grips with her decision. It is because I sit at home every night thinking, you know, did I do the right thing? I mean, I know I've got to be doing the right thing because, I mean, I can't give her the special needs that she needs to maintain out here in the world and stuff and I mean but I just still beat myself up thinking am I just giving her up or what but but I want to do the right thing it will be several months before Damar has a room available for Chelsea for now the nine-year-old remains hospitalized just minutes away from her home come summer Chelsea will leave the only life she knows in Bloomington Twenty-seven-year-old mother Mary Gruber is immersed in the juvenile justice and child welfare system. It's a system this divorced single mother of three knows well. As a child, Mary herself was a ward of the state. Today, she enters the courtroom of Indianapolis juvenile judge James Payne without her nine-year-old son, Dwayne. He currently lives in an inpatient treatment facility after setting fire to the family apartment. In an investigation following the fire, it was also alleged that Duane had touched his younger brother and sister's private areas. Duane's former child welfare case manager recommended the nine-year-old be placed in a treatment facility specifically for children with sexual problems. Duane's been gone five months, and Mary wants her son home. The court believes Duane still needs help. Well, they, they, they told me at Resolute that they would not let him come home until my youngest two children can get into counseling to talk about what Wayne's done to them. First of all, Your Honor, my daughter is one, my son is two. They don't know if, if, if he did do it to them, fondled them. They don't know that. They don't know what that is. How, how can they hold my son until they go into counseling? They don't know what it is. How are they going to talk about it? You Treatment I mean? providers involved with Wayne's case say he shows classic symptoms of early childhood trauma, most likely physical and or sexual abuse. Duane has mentioned such abuse, but because he says it happened before he turned five, his testimony is difficult to substantiate. Duane is now what the court calls a chins case, short for children in need of services. Let's make clear who makes the decisions. They won't make the decision I will. And that decision will be based on, in part on their report, in part on, on the work that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to raise him in that facility. Uh, he's going to come home at some point, so I need you to Mary believes to her son is a victim, alleging Duane was molested as a toddler. At the treatment facility where Duane lives, counselors say the nine-year-old has talked about sexual encounters with dozens of other children, including his younger brother and sister. If true, this classifies Duane as a child sexual perpetrator something his mom doesn't like to think about. Dwayne has touched him. So, I mean, even if he did, or if he, I can't say he did. I can't say it didn't happen. But at least I'm aware of it, that it could have happened. And now I can prevent it.
A month after we first meet Mary, she's back before juvenile judge James Payne. Dwayne is still living at a treatment facility, but is in court this time along with his counselors. The hearing is excruciating for Dwayne as he sits and listens to his mother plead with Judge Payne to let him come home. I'm not going to deprive him of the help he would need, but I do want my son home with me. I can take care of my son. I've been taking care of him for five years on my own, and I have two others. I've taken care of three kids for the last five years by myself. I'm not a bad mother. I've always been there. Like I told my son, no matter what you do, I will always be there. I'm not going to give up on you. You are my child. And I beg, I'm not, I ask you, I ask the court to bring him home and let me show you. The behavior that I've read about and the reason that this case came before the court back in January indicated significant issues. And ma'am, while I know no one is suggesting that you're a bad mother, but there is a clear indication that Duane has more problems, more issues, more um, behavior that needs to be addressed that I think can be addressed in this short period of time. Judge Payne realizes the magnitude of this case and the difficulty in handling child sexual perpetrators nationally. 50% of adolescent sex offenders have been sexually abused themselves. 70% have experienced neglect, according to the National Clearinghouse on Family Violence. Dr. Mina Dulkin is a child psychiatrist at Northwestern Memorial and Children's Memorial Hospitals in Chicago. She says she sees children like Duane all too often. Um. The difficult thing is that we know that children who have been abused or traumatized when they're very young, their brains actually change and their hormone systems change so that they remain overactive and over-responsive to stress later. So they're always vulnerable. Duane's been on several medications since he entered the child welfare system five months ago. He has been diagnosed as learning disabled, suffering from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and has a functioning IQ of 67. Is this nine-year-old a threat to the community? For now, it's decided Duane will not go home. The issue of Duane is much more complicated, but I think fairly clear, and that is we have a nine-year-old boy who has more information and is engaged in more behavior than any nine-year-old should. Judge Payne bases his decision on the testimony he hears in court. Uh, at this point, I think release is premature at best. You're an alleged father? His colleague, child. Mary Beth Bonaventura, is senior judge in gritty, blue-collar Gary, Indiana, 135 miles northwest of Indianapolis. The two talk often about their juvenile caseloads. You can't be a normal human being and hear some of this stuff and it not just get to you so bad. Even after 18 years of doing it, you would think you would get used to this or I've kind of seen it all sort of attitude. And, and every time I have hearings of child abuse and neglect, it seems like I'm doing it for the first time. It, it hurts, you know, it just hurts, especially to, to think about that these are children that, you know, nobody's really there to protect. So critical choices are left up to the courts. And another hearing is scheduled for Duane in 60 days. I am a mother. I can take care of my son. I want my son at home. I can give him the help he may need. Later, another hearing. Will Judge Payne see enough progress to send Duane home? But up next, a mother fights for custody of her four-day-old baby. Back in Indianapolis, the judge prepares for an initial hearing for four-day-old Asia Bell. Asia's mother, 28-year-old Vanessa, sits in front of the judge today without her newborn baby. This case came to the courts and the child welfare system when Asia was born cocaine positive. Vanessa has tried to kick her drug habit for years. So far, rehab hasn't worked. So you've already been in rehab. Mm -hmm. Then why would you do it again? Vanessa now has to admit that her daughter is a child in need of services. There's been filed in this case a petition alleging that uh, Asia ch is a child in need of services. Have you received a copy of that petition? Uh, yeah. Do you have a chance to go through that? Yeah. Mother's looking at you again. At Vanessa's side is her mother, who is concerned about the fate of her four-day-old granddaughter. Vivian Bell recognizes Asia is a cocaine baby, but she's determined to support Vanessa and get the baby back. If she did all the things that the court required her to do, would there be any chance at all of her getting the baby back? Well, there's a chance, yeah. 
Sure. It's not our job to take children from parents, but to make sure children are safe and protected. As you sit in court and watch this, it's amazing how not just the parents focus on the reasons why they're not doing things, but everyone else does too. And no one says, literally, no one says, hey, these kids are important. We don't care about you. After court, Vanessa and her mom talk about Vanessa's addiction, a cocaine habit so intense, even at nine months pregnant, Vanessa still could not stay away from the drug. Because she went out two days before she was born and mm. fell. <laughs> I'm not a drug user. I never have even attempted, don't want to, but I know for a fact that it is some powerful stuff. And it seems to make your mind just make you feel like you crazy. Don't care. You, it just, you just don't care. The focus for a number of years has been parents and parents' rights to kids. And, and, and what parents are doing or not doing and forgetting about the kids, that these kids are sitting in limbo waiting for that person who is responsible for them to be responsible. And, and it's tough to get the system away from that. Thirty days after we first meet Vanessa, we're back in court again. But this time, the stakes are much higher. Baby Asia has now been in foster care for over a month. This morning is another Chin's hearing, but unlike her first court appearance, today Vanessa is on trial. Child welfare case manager Nancy Brown is about to give some damaging Grace testimony. Right hand, Do you swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done? At that time, did Vanessa Bell admit to using cocaine during her pregnancy with Asia? Yes. Okay. Did she admit to using up to a week before the delivery of her child? She admitted using it a week before uh -huh. the child. Yes. And did she admit to having a substance abuse addiction? Yes. All right. Is there a parent currently, uh, Ms. Brown, who is capable of caring for or appropriately parenting Asia Bell? Not in my opinion, no. Okay. Case manager Brown says Vanessa has three daughters and a son who are in the legal custody of Vanessa's mother. Vanessa's parental rights were terminated to a fifth child, who was also born cocaine positive. But it's now Vanessa's turn to testify. As she takes the stand, the future of her baby girl rests with Judge Payne. Um, I don't know if it matters or not, but I've been going to, um, I've been seeing her every Monday. I've been going to my meetings. I've been clean now for 42 days. Um, Whatever I have to do to get my baby back, I will. That's all. Okay, anything further you want to say? Um, no. I'm trying really hard. Did you want her to say something else, ma'am? I didn't want to just emphasize on so much as getting the baby back. I want to emphasize on the whole process of herself staying clean and being a mother and getting her babies back, her baby back. I mean, I just don't want them to pimp, make it look like she's just doing it to get the baby back. I want to do it for herself. You know, self-preservation first. If she preserve herself, then everything else will fall in place. Anything else? At stake is whether or not Asia will get to leave foster care and go home. But if Judge Payne declares that Asia is a chins, a child in need of services, Vanessa won't be getting her baby back anytime soon. She listens nervously as Judge Payne makes his decision. Uh, the court will find, since Indiana law requires that even a reporting of a trace amount of a legend drug or a uh, controlled substance is sufficient for the finding of a child in need of services with the record submitted, the court will find that Vanessa, uh, as to Vanessa Bell, Asia Bell is a child in need of services. She's a good girl. She has a heart of gold, but she just fell through that crack and just couldn't get out. We've had fights and arguments, and, but that, you know, I still love her and I want her to do right and I want her to be a mother to her children like I was a mother to her. But bringing Asia home won't be easy. That will depend on Vanessa's fight to stay clean and ultimately what Judge Payne decides is in the baby's best interest. I just take it one day at a time. It depends on how bad you really want it. If you really want to be sober, stay clean, you can do it, but it's not easy. Like Vanessa and baby Asia, 
Nine-year-old Dwayne's future also lies in the hands of Judge Payne. Ahead, Dwayne learns if he'll get to go home in time for Christmas. Plus the story of a remarkable girl. Through more than 20 foster homes and 13 years in the system, she seems to defy all odds. Every once in a while in the child welfare and juvenile justice system, you meet an exceptional child who seems to defy all the odds. Such is the case with Delina. At 17, Delina has been a ward of the court ever since she can remember. Well, I've always been so independent my whole life um, because well, I've been actually in the system for almost 11 and a half years. Um, I was taken away from my mom whenever I was four and in a foster home until I was 12. And I was in about 15, 20 different foster homes. And, you know, um, I just, I grew up by myself. I had to. Delina comes to court this winter morning for a regularly scheduled review hearing for herself and her son, Gavin. Both mother and son remain wards of the court uh, Delina, and in the same it foster is home. that you remain a ward and in your present placement. Do you Judge Talaferro is especially open with Delina in court. She sees the remarkable determination of this like teenage it. mom. Right. So how's the baby? He's great. He is so smart. He's two and a half and I actually have a picture. Oh, I'd love to see it. Okay. Thank you for bringing that. I don't think I've... I did see him once, but he was... Just a baby. Oh my, how old is he now? As far as Chin's hearings go, Delina seems to be an example of just how resilient kids can be. Delina and her son have been with foster mom Kathy Brown for almost three years. Lainey, you've done very well in foster care. There's not been one problem since you've been placed in foster care. Not one. Thank you for bringing the picture. What a healthy child. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Take care of yourself. See you in about six months. <laughs> well, she's done such a great job. Yes, she, she really has. I'm so proud of her. Outside the judge's doors, Delina talks about Gavin's father. Two weeks after um, I got, he left me, which will be Valentine's Day of 98, he went and got with my friend, and now she had a baby. And she was also 14, and he's 22. My mom did let him stay the night with me, which, I mean, if I have a daughter at 14 years old, she's not bringing a 20-year-old man in my house and stay the night with him. In fact, she better not even have a 20-year-old boyfriend. <laughs> Gavin's father is currently serving time for the statutory rape of Delina's friend. Teenage mothers generally face the future alone. Nearly 80% of the fathers of children born to teenage mothers never marry mom and pay on average just $800 a year in child support. That's a scary proposition for a young person to face adulthood as a single parent uh, without, with limited education, with limited job skills. I don't know how the, some of the young people survive. I blame my mom for the things that she's done to me. Um, like my mom kicked me out of my house whenever I was pregnant. Finally, they put me with my foster mom that I have now and she is wonderful. I've been there since my son was three months old, and I probably won't leave until I'm like 20, <laughs> something like that. Foster mom Kathy Brown has been a big influence in Delina's life. Delina has been in dozens of foster homes since she was a toddler, but this is a house she calls a home. Delina and Gavin moved in when Delina was 15 and Gavin was just three months old. Kathy admits that it's tough to think about the day the two of them will move out. The longer they stay with me, the greater our bond is. And um, one of the things Delina does really well, or tries to do really well, is think about what's best for Gavin. She can't always make her decisions based on that, but she tries. And I think she probably believes that it's good for Gavin to continue to see me, and, and I think that it's good for her to see me. Dr. Mina Dokun is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and believes lack of stability is a huge problem for kids in the system. Child welfare or child protection systems often compound the results of the abuse because they take the child out and they put them here and then here and then here and then here. And it's not at all uncommon for us to see children who've been in five or six foster homes by the time they're six. And, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, to help children when they've had so much lack of stability. Dancing at the party. You went dancing at the party. <laughs> but to kids like Delina, 
who seemingly break the cycle ever fully escape. The odds are against her, but Delina's determined to make it. I've always been there. Like I told my son, no matter what you do, I will always be there. When we last saw 27-year-old mom, Mary Groover, she was fighting to get her son I back. Beg, not, I asked you, I asked the court to bring him home and let me show you. Dwayne had set fire to the family apartment and is believed to have acted out sexually with other children. Dwayne has been living at a residential treatment facility for child sexual perpetrators for the past seven months. Today, the judge learns the necessary safety plan, an agreement between the court and Dwayne's mom, Mary, that lays out Dwayne's supervision once he returns home, is not yet complete. Dwayne won't go home today, but there is an end in sight. We'll set this matter in 60 days on. So he'll be home within 30 days? Mm -hmm. That is the plan of Family Works, that he'll be home within 30 days. What they talk about in the cycle of violence, what one generation tolerates, the next will take to excess. The abused child tends to become an abusive parent, and parents tend to have two children. So that, that abused child will be an abusive parent to two children who will tend to be abusive toward their two children, which is a total of four, so we're going from one to two to four to eight, we're going up geometrically. It's my experience that most perpetrators have been victims. Unfortunately, I don't see a lot of success rate in treatment of perpetrators, adult or children. Georgette Powell is Duane's child welfare case manager. You get to the point where you see perpetrators not prosecuted, getting to walk the streets, adults, you see kids that aren't really getting the therapeutic services they need. You have parents who just walk away from their kids and never look back. For Mary, the cycle of violence is vivid. She describes her own childhood as a lot tougher than Dwayne's. Because my son ain't being abused like I was. My son ain't being molested like I was. My son ain't going through hell like I did. And my son ain't struggling like I did. When we see the family in court again for Duane's review hearing, a month and a half has passed since the previous hearing. Duane is back living at home with his mom and siblings. A safety plan is in place to lower the risk of Duane acting out sexually. Judge Payne looks forward to closing this nine-month-old case. Should temporary extended in-home visit to continue, set this matter for December 22nd at 8.30 and look forward to closing this out on that date. Anything further? While things seem to be looking better for Duane, sex abuse statistics are far less encouraging. Nationally, more than 100,000 children are confirmed as victims of sexual abuse annually, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As for Duane, he's back home in time for Christmas. But for this nine-year-old and his family, as we'll see, this story is far from over. And true to her word, a month after our first visit, Melissa is adapting to her new high school. Child welfare case manager Gretchen Gentry is at Melissa's foster home today to check on Melissa's progress. This is my first time since the incident, so yeah, I will. Are you scared? Melissa is also learning to take care of her baby. This includes administering seizure medication to Raven. Today will be the first time Melissa does it herself. It is care fate. And how many times a day does she take him? Go look at her chart. I know she takes it. Six, ten, two, and six. Yep, milliliter. Milliliter. Yep. So would it be right there? Uh-uh, uh-uh. You want me to do the other two while you pull up the tiger top? I forgot how much she takes of it. Can we put 2.5 mils in it? Right there. Just shake it. The top of the black line, because if you put them upside down, Don't they'll leak it. out. Melissa knows this current shared foster placement for her and her daughter Raven is as close as she'll come to a family at this stage in her life. She misses her brother, who is in a separate foster home, and her sister, who is currently a runaway. Melissa says she still loves her parents, but doesn't let herself think about being with her mom and dad anymore. When I ran away, I was around my mom and my dad, and I seen that they didn't want to make no changes in their life. They um, wanted to keep doing what they wanted to do, and don't want to take care of their kids, don't want to try, so I gave up on that. I do. Melissa has been out of her home and awarded the court over 15 months. Today, by law, 
the state must file a termination of parental rights petition against Melissa's parents. The termination is not automatic, but unless there's a compelling reason to drop it, the hearing to completely sever all parental rights will be finalized anywhere from 90 days to one year. <laughs> Melissa's parents declined to talk oh, on camera, so but say they are remorseful that their family has been torn apart. Chin up. Sure you're okay? Okay. Cause number 2000 JC704 in the matter of Raven. In less than a week's time, Melissa returns to Judge Payne's court for a review on her daughter Raven's case. It's just five days later, but the situation between Melissa and her foster mom takes a drastic turn. After months of living under the same roof, molding as a family, raising Raven together and turning her life around, it seems Melissa has started to feel the pull of her old friends and family. Things are beginning to unravel. Um, she refuses to be accountable and she refuses to be honest about her actions. Anything else I need to know? No, that would be it. Melissa, anything you want to say? Nope. I thought I was pretty direct with you last time. It was. Some of our kids start to do real well and then figure they don't deserve it. Or they don't like it. Or it's not as much fun as it was on the street. Are you there? Is that what you've decided? No. Well, you've got two worlds. The one you're living in right now and the one you used to live in. You cannot have both. Which one do you want? I want the one I have now. Then you're going to have to give up on the other one. Your grades, how are they? They're good. No, they're not. They're great. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing everything right, except you're tr starting to get back to where you used to be. My job is the accountability arm. I will hold you accountable, Melissa. Chicago's Cook County Public Guardian, Patrick Murphy, knows how hard it is for kids to break the bond with old friends and family. But he says there comes a point when the state must terminate a parent's rights if it's in the child's best interest. Our government and all governments have traditionally deferred to the family and said, how you raise your children within certain limits is up to you. At some point, I think we have to start taking that line and making it a little firmer because we defer too often to a lot of people who are doing a horrible job of raising their kids. At what point does the state step in? And at what point does the state say, I'm sorry, you're doing a terrible job, we're going to take them away. But once we do that then, we have to provide the professional resources for these kids. The Adoption of and Safe Families Act, we um, have got some now guidelines that we have to move children through the system somewhat faster than we ever did before, uh, which has really you know, helped because it, it makes caseworkers put their feet to the fire and do their jobs a little faster than they otherwise would have. It makes court schedule cases. every We hear cases now every three and six months for review, where in the past you reviewed matters every year, sometimes 18 months. No matter how tough things get, Melissa says she's determined to carve the right path for herself you ready? and Raven. Want to take your medicine, honey? I know when I spoke to Melissa, her goals were uh, a week and a month at a time, and we're looking at years at a time. Nationally, so. fewer than one-third of teenage mothers finish high school. Yet after being away from school for three years, Melissa is earning straight A's. Her confidence is intact, and she says she's looking forward to her next hearing on May 24th. I know what changes I have to make, and I can do it. Coming up, life takes a dramatic turn for foster mom Karen Butterworth. Stupid, I was so stupid. And Vanessa finds out if she finally gets her daughter back. She was considered the star child. In Bloomington, Delina goes back to court much sooner than expected. I vote in my case, that I know that I have been a disappointment. And the trauma in Dwayne's case that will change his life forever. Termination. Don't worry about it. You're fine. 